You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. We be broadcasting, as always, from the Vivid Seats studios. Use promo code OVERTIME in the Vivid Seats mobile app to save up to $100 on all ticket purchases. First time customer zone. So I've got two main objectives here today. I just finished breaking down the Vikings Falcons game and really it's it's I, I just did the video I'm working on processing it and getting it uploaded to the uh Pack Daddy Premium Facebook group that is uh, available to anybody who is giving $10 or more on Patreon but really it was pretty much watching every play in the first quarter a couple in the second and like one in the fourth because you kind of just get the idea but uh kind of going over what I saw my thoughts on this particular game, and of course we got to talk about Minka Fitzpatrick because that's all anybody. I don't even I don't even want to talk about it. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. I'm just not interested in talking about it, and I won't tell you why because it's pretty much going to sum up my thoughts. So we'll we'll leave it at uh, we'll talk about that first and get it out of the way. Just just I, I don't know. I tried to find that scene from the office to play and I just couldn't find it. You know where Aaron's like talking about her personal problems and Jim's in the car and he's like I'm uh I'm gonna go. And then they cut to him later, and he's like, I'm sorry, that just that just wasn't interesting to me. That's how I felt on Twitter yesterday with the whole Minka Fitzpatrick. I put out a question, and I was like, so what's going on with Minka? Like, anybody, people lost. They're like, what are you talking about? He's the greatest guy ever. And, of course, nobody's been watching him. Nobody has any idea what's going on in Miami. They freaked out. And then I was like, well, PFF said he wasn't very good, so I'm just kind of curious. And then they find, like, a couple PFF stats and everything. It's just, like, we know he was a high, he was a high draft pick in round one and that's pretty much all we know about Minka nobody has paid any attention to him since he moved to Miami nobody realizes that it fine I guess we're getting into it now nobody realizes that he single-handedly made all those Hollywood Brown highlights against uh, the Baltimore Ravens you know what his stat line was in week one against a rookie six targets six receptions 117 yards 59 yards after the catch three touchdowns and a perfect passer rating when targeted also, on a per-snap basis, this is every time the ball is snapped, not every time he was targeted, every time the ball was snapped, he gave up 5.85 yards. He gave a reception up once every three snaps. Every third time they snapped the ball was a catch by the guy that Minka Fitzpatrick was guarding. All of these stats are worst, anywhere from third worst to worst in the NFL in week one. Now, everybody kind of has bad days, but he single-handedly lost that game for the Baltimore, for the uh, the Miami Dolphins. Six receptions, by the way, is the most any corner in, or excuse me, any safety in the NFL gave up uh, in Week One. 117 yards is the most yards any safety gave up in Week One. Three touchdowns is the most any safety gave up in in Week One. There was only one other safety that had two touchdowns given up, and that was Mr. Jermaine Whitehead. We remember him. And then there were only, let's see, uh, I think maybe 11 or 12 guys that gave up one touchdown. Everyone else is zeros. Minka gave up three. So please excuse me when I ask the question, are we sure that he's as good as we thought he was coming out of college? And the common refrain typically is, well, he's not the greatest safety, but he's really good in the slot, which, yeah, maybe. 
here's the problem, though. He primarily played in the slot for Miami, so much so that PFF called him a cornerback. That was his label. I tried to find him as safety. He wasn't in there. He's with the cornerbacks. He was graded as the 110th best cornerback in the NFL in 2018. 110th. Granted, in 2018, that would have made him our third best, or excuse me, our second best corner after Jair, because Josh Jackson was 132nd, Kevin King was 138th, and Bashad Breeland was 154th. But I'm thinking top 100 should be kind of the minimum. So again, excuse me for asking the question, but I felt the need to ask the question. He had a below average tackling grade, a below average pass rush grade, and a below average coverage grade. The only thing he really did well was run defense. Makes me a little bit nervous, right? So, I, the bottom line is, I, I guess I just don't care. Um, I just want somebody to pick him up so we can move on. I'm, I'm almost to the point where I'm getting tired of these things because <laughs> it, it just it, it pops up. Packer fans freak out. We got to get him. Everybody wants him. Everybody says we got to get him. I don't know, man. Between Jair, um, Tremont, Kevin King, Tony Brown, Darnell Savage, Raven Green, Adrian Amos, and Minka Fitzpatrick, who do you think had the worst week one performance? It would be Minka. It would be Minka by a lot. And, you know, maybe we can blame that on Miami. Maybe we could say that a lot of guys Hollywood Brown would have torched. You know, I, I don't really know. But, again, it makes me a little bit nervous, especially when we're talking about giving up players, giving up draft picks, whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not so sure. But if we get him, that's cool. And why is it okay? And why am I not going to be upset despite the fact that I'm nervous? Because that means the Packers have evaluated him on a much higher level than I have. They believe that he is, in fact, a good player. And not only that, they have a specific plan for him. And that's going to get me excited because that's a good thing. In fact, they believe he's going to be such an upgrade that they're willing to give up X, Y, and Z compensation. That's going to get me extra excited because I don't think the Packers personnel people are dummies. I'm just saying prior to actually understanding what the Packers believe... I have some questions, and I'm concerned about what level I'm willing to pay and um, what exactly his job is going to be. Presumably, he's going to be in the slot, and if it's true that he is a really good slot corner and a lot of his mishaps have been at safety, perhaps that's what happened in Miami where when he took the top off, he was Minka was playing safety and um, just couldn't get there. I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't watch it, and I'm not going to watch it because, again, not that interested. But real quickly, let's look at what he did in the slot last year because there is a metric by pff to look at his slot coverage snaps per reception you want this to be a very very big number how many times did they snap the ball before you gave up a reception minka fitzpatrick in the slot was ranked 43rd overall um 10 10 was his number 10 snaps for every reception he gives up snaps per target should be a smaller number because presumably there were certain times you were targeted and broke up a pass but still you want as big of a number as possible minka fitzpatrick ranked 100th 100th. Now, the disp- that, that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, because if there's a big disparity between targets and receptions, that means that you were targeted a lot and they weren't able to do much. So snaps per target, I'm not as interested in, but snaps per reception, you know, he was 43rd. And I think the, the best metric is actually yards per snap. And the reason I think yards per snap is, is the best is because essentially it's not only snaps per target, but it's snaps per reception, but also how impactful were these snaps. So you gave up a bunch of passes, but I mean, were they quick little passes? Were they deep passes? I mean, where did, where did you kind of mess this up? So how many yards on a given snap? Minka was 41st with uh, one yard per snap. And if I actually minimize this or, or, you know, get rid of some of these guys that have very few opportunities here, he ranked 11th. He actually ranked tied with Jair Alexander. So some reason for optimism there. And then as some people pointed out, he actually has the highest or excuse me, the lowest technically, but he's number one in NFL passer rating when targeted from the slot. I'm less interested in that. I think his yards per snap being 11th is the most impressive. And the reason I say that is because he had two picks, which is awesome. And you want a guy that gets the ball, you know, which I'm sure will appeal to the Packers. That's a big emphasis. They want a guy that's going to get it. But we're talking about two picks and we're talking about something that's very fleeting. And um, I'm not going to rely on him getting two picks consistently. Instead, I'm looking at 20 receptions for 200 yards, which is relatively high. Um, and then if you take away those two interceptions, the pass rating obviously doesn't look quite as good. But again, I think his yards per snap being 11th, being tied with Jair Alexander is is pretty impressive. And I wouldn't mind that quite so much. It depends on the compensation, obviously. Actually, I don't really care about the compensation as much as I care about the production. If he can come in and, and legitimately be a top slot uh, corner, 
I don't hate it at all, especially when you consider Tremont aging. Uh, I like Tremont a lot, but Mink is younger, Mink is faster, and if he's also much more talented than Tremont, um, I'm just worried that he's not, I guess is all I'm saying. So, I mean, again, if, if the Packers do it, I'm going to get super, super, super excited. Why? Because the Packers are basically telling me in that moment, not only are we getting him, but yes, he's as good as you think he is. Yes, he's as good as people say he is. And yes, we're willing to pay for this guy. In fact, we were willing to pay more than every other team in the NFL, with the exception of Miami, who doesn't really have an option to keep him because he wants out. And that will get me very excited. However, if we don't get him, I'm not going to be upset. I'm just not. I mean, you know, we're not going to get everybody, even if he gets picked up somewhere else and has a great career and is a Hall of Famer. I'm just, it's like, yeah, well, you know, we're not going to have every Hall of Famer in the world. We got what we got. I like what we got. And uh, let's do what we can do. And if we have an opportunity to upgrade at something that isn't too costly, let's do it. But I'm I'm really more focused on, I'm sounding like a coach now. I'm focused on Minnesota right now. You know, I'm trying to focus on next week. And the Minka stuff just, I don't know, again just isn't interesting to me it'll become interesting when the news breaks that the Packers got them but unless and until that happens just I'm, I'm not super interested and this is pretty much all I have to say about it why don't we take a break and then we'll have a little chat about what I saw watching the Minnesota Vikings and what I think is going to be paramount in said game ladies and gentlemen Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to make this long because it, the observations I can sum up pretty quickly let, let, let me do a summary of what I what I saw from the Vikings and Falcons uh, essentially as much as it looked like a blowout I don't think that it was um, the biggest issue for the Falcons there, there were two issues number one is they kept making dumb mistakes number two was Devondre Campbell their linebacker who just completely blew the entire game Devondre Campbell was horrible He's a weak side linebacker. His job is to flow to the side, to, to get where the ball is, and take the guy down. And everybody pretty much did their job, except Devondre Campbell, who did not have the speed to get past linemen that are falling down trying to, to reach him, to block him. Uh, he couldn't quite get around him. He didn't seem to have much interest in getting around people. He actually was, like, running into people. Uh, I don't, I don't, it just, it was embarrassing. So that's going to be one of the keys. Um Their outside zone runs were successful almost entirely because the linebackers couldn't get there in time. We need guys, Blake Martinez, B.J. Goodson, whatever safeties are in the box, whatever safeties are up high, guys like Savage being able to close in and and get there in time, guys like Jair not being blocked on the outside, guys like Kevin King not being blocked on the outside, being fast, being aggressive, being physical, to say you're not getting out here. This is not safe territory for you. And if you want to see a good example of that, watch the Vikings against the Falcons. When the Falcons tried to get outside, the linebackers were incredibly fast. They ran around blockers, right? If there was congestion, they ran around it. They didn't run into it. The defensive line um, was, you know, they were they were getting to the outside shoulder of the blockers, so they weren't actually blocked. And it, it just created a wall. The defenders were there. There was nothing there. Falcons couldn't do it. Packers have to do it. Because the fact of the matter is, as much as Vikings fans want to brag about how good the run game was, it just it wasn't impressive. I mean, if anything was impressive, it was the offensive line, especially the tight ends and offensive linemen who got to the next level and got to these incredibly slow and, and ridiculously hesitant linebackers. Dalvin Cook ran uncontested every single run. The only times when he didn't run uncontested is when he tried to run up the gut, and I counted exactly one run that was between the guard and tackle that went for positive yardage. Once again, it was Devondre Campbell who wasn't able to get around, and that this was literally an offensive lineman falling, trying to, so he tripped, trying to get to the linebacker, 
this should have been super easy for Devondre Campbell to start running as fast as he could. The the lead linebacker. So you got your strong side linebacker, and you got somebody else, whether it's an outside line. It depends what it is. We'll pretend it was a Mike linebacker. There wasn't. But these two guys are going to take It's a numbers game. We have three defenders. They have two blockers. Our first two defenders take on their first two blockers. Our weak side linebacker runs out there, meets the running back, takes him down, done. It doesn't work. If you're standing there and get blocked, now suddenly the numbers are in the favor of the running back who runs uncontested. But every time he tried to run to the inside, with the exception of one that I saw, there was nowhere to go. So if you essentially take that away because you have better linebackers or safeties or whatever, I didn't see the Vikings do a whole lot. Obviously, they didn't throw the ball very much. Uh, on the flip side, there were several times. So the the Vikings' first two touchdowns came on a very, very short field, followed by running backs running uncontested into the end zone because linebackers are terrible. I'm not throwing a parade for the Vikings on that. Another drive that they drove down the field, there were two third downs in which the Vikings couldn't convert, and the the Falcons had uh, defensive holding, defensive pass interference plays that converted first downs. So again, the, the, fa- the second thing the Falcons did was get in their own way. As far as the Vikings' defense, it, it was... It looked pretty good in terms of especially the linebackers being fast and, and making good decisions... And I'll get on that in a second, because essentially what what it is, the Falcons kind of figured them out. The Falcons were able to move down the field no problem. However, the Falcons move down the field, and then they fumble. The Falcons move down the field, threw a pick in the end zone, because Matt Ryan doesn't know how to throw a pass out of bounds, and he doesn't throw it hard enough, and it goes into the hands of the defender. Another drive, they marching right down the field. Third down, they convert it. It's a, uh, a holding penalty. It gets called back. Now it's third and long, and they get sacked. Three drives are marching down the field, and they, they basically put their own foot in their mouth. They got in their own way. And then the fourth time when they're driving down the field, this is just in the first half. The fourth time they're driving down the field, two big plays, halftime. So the clock got them. The Vikings didn't shut down the Falcons' offense at all. The Falcons shut down the Falcons' offense. And I think one of the keys, and it's a big difference between the Bears and the, the Vikings, is that the Bears were very, very um, patient at the linebacker position. They waited and they waited and they waited and then they they flowed in the right direction very, very quickly at exactly the right time. It was unbelievably hard to even look at it and say, I don't know what we could have done different. That was just great play by the linebackers. The Vikings, aggressive. This is exactly the kind of of aggressive defense that Matt LaFleur is going to want to take advantage of because essentially what killed this team for the, the what the Falcons figured out in the second half and they just started charging down the field, this time actually getting touchdowns, except they marched down the field, got a touchdown, tried a two-point conversion, couldn't get it. Marched down the field again, got a touchdown, didn't convert the, the two-point conversion, and then the game was over. But essentially it was, it was basic play action because the linebackers are so aggressive. As soon as you go to hand the ball off, they're flying. And that just left a lot of vacancies in the middle of the field. It left one-on-one man matchups that uh, guys were able to beat. And if they're going man-to-man, we got to have guys that can win is going to be the biggest thing, right? So um, in those situations, they were hitting guys like Muhammad Sanu and and um, and Calvin Ridley because those guys were, were man-to-man by themselves and just wide open green grass in the middle of the field because the safeties are deep respecting the speed and the linebackers are up at the line of scrimmage trying to stop a run that never existed. Uh, the one caveat I'll put in there is not to get too cute. There were times when you'd have a lot of motion and you'd have basically a wide receiver motion to the tight end position, try to block an outside linebacker because you assume he's going to run a route, he stays in to block, gets obliterated, and then you get a sack. Let's not get too creative. I, I think basic basic motion type stuff, and one of the things that was very effective for the Falcons is something that was very effective for the Packers, and that is just these short little out routes. But I think if you, if you add the Packers' level of misdirection, which is a little bit more advanced than the Falcons. The Falcons did use some motion. Occasionally you saw things where you'd have two guys moving after the snap in different directions to kind of throw things off. But not a lot of it. And you definitely didn't have the, the, the tight ends kind of motioning to the other side and then running routes or block, you know, that kind of stuff where that's just a staple of the offense. That just didn't really happen. But I think this is another, another level of complexity that the Vikings are going to have to be able to compete with. Now... They're going to have a lot of practice because, as I said, this is basically the same kind of offense that the, the Vikings are running. They're running a very similar style of offense in the Packers, so they're going to have plenty of practice in terms of how to stop it. However, this is not something that the defensive coordinator or this defense that's been here for a long time is exactly used to. Right? This, they haven't seen this a lot, even though they have an offensive coordinator that can kind of give them a lot of practice reps. 
it's it's going to be different, and it, it's going to be hard to assess because it's a different game plan. So the the defense is going to act differently, the Packers are going to act differently. But really, what it came down to in that game is that the Vikings just played fundamental solid football, and the Falcons were sloppy. And um, if, if we're going to win this game, if, if we've got to play better football. The defense played great, but if if the offense is going to play sloppy again, we're going to have a hard time. Now, I think the Packers are going to be better at protecting the football. I think there were two fumbles that they lost in a pick, so three turnovers. That's pathetic. Let's not give them the ball. And, the, and there was a, uh, maybe I'm wrong about one of the fumbles. I don't know, because there was also a punt block. So that would be four turnovers, if I'm correct. It was at least three, maybe four. But also, you know, penalties on crucial third downs on both sides of the ball. I mean, j- just on both sides of the ball, I mean, even Matt Ryan, he had an easy third down conversion. He just airmailed it out of bounds. And then he had the, the pick where he tried to throw it. And it, it, was, it was first and two, I think. They ran the ball, didn't get it. Now it's second and two, and then he just throws it to the defender, trying to get it out of bounds. I mean, it's just, it's pathetic after you march all the way down the field. So the the bottom line here is the Vikings are beatable, but they're going to play good football. The offensive line can't pass block. They're not the greatest run blocking unit out there, but they're going to get there. And they're, they're, they're running really good scheme wise. And it's a matter of they're going to execute, whether they're going to execute it really well, or just eventually they're going to execute it. And if we're going to play like the Falcons and not get these linebackers and, and whatever safeties or whatever are playing at that that sort of middle level there, whoever it is, corners, linebackers, safeties, defensive tackles, whoever's at that level is going to have to be able to have the speed to get out around these linemen. That's going to be the biggest thing if we're going to stop this this run game because, again, it's all about numbers. When you're running to that direction, they're going to have lead blockers. So it's going to be important to have guys like Preston Smith to take out. You want to take out as many blockers as you can to make sure that somebody's there to come up and make the tackle. And the other thing is swarm. The Vikings do a great job of swarming. The Bears do a great job of swarming. Last week, the Packers did a fantastic job of swarming. The Falcons are pathetic at, at trying to swarm. Essentially, everybody gets blocked up, and it's a matter of hoping somebody can make a play, but nobody does. And the linebackers don't even have the speed, Devondre Campbell, to get around linemen who are trying to reach him, and did reach him literally every single time. Don't let them reach you because then it's a numbers game in our favor. And beyond that, if somebody just wins, you know, if Preston's trying to get blocked and he gets off there and gets to the next level and gets to the next blocker, the numbers are in our favor again. And that's why these big maulers, that's why you get the Mike Patton style of defense, which is, yeah, we don't have exactly the best, or I shouldn't say we don't have the best pass rushers. That's not the goal is to not have pass rushers. But the reason you get rid of a Mike Daniels, who's a gap shooter to go get the quarterback and you replace him with these big, long, strong guys is that the goal is to just blow it up. Right, they're trying to run this real creative, real smooth, real organized, orchestrated outside zone with these pulling blockers. And if you just get these hand grenades in there that just blow everything up. I mean, if, if you have Preston Smith that hits a, a tackle and drives him back into the lead blockers, the play is over. The play is wildly over, and he's immediately got to cut it back inside. Right, Just, just getting something basic like penetration is going to blow that play up. Because not only does a running back need to get around, both of the, the blockers who are just barely scraping the offensive line need to be able to get out and around to get to these, these linebackers. So that is essentially it, and that's, that's going to be a big thing because they had no success whatsoever running to the inside. They were able to, Dalvin Cook ran uncontested, as did Alexander Madison, their, um, their rookie. They, they just ran uncontested on the outside because the, you know, they just ran a basic outside zone play, and the Falcons just couldn't, couldn't stop it. And I don't know why the Vikings got away from it, to be honest. I mean, it was just, just if it's me, I'm just going to, it's like Madden, right? This play works, I'm just going to keep running it until I get bored with it or they stop it. Maybe that's what it was. The Vikings were so far ahead, they're like, this is boring and I don't want to look lazy. Let's try at least something else. I don't know. Get some practice reps on running to the inside. But th- but that's going to be a big thing is speed and intelligence at, at the second level, the, the linebacker level. But discipline is also going to be important. And then outside of that, it, it really is just the Packers offense needs to play better. The uh, Vikings defense is beatable. You can manipulate the linebackers, but but they're also a good defense. Safeties are incredible. The linebackers are fast and intelligent. And if they're not out of position, they're going to get there. If you're trying to run outside zone, they're going to get there. What we need to be able to do is to use misdirection and, and I think really just come out super aggressive with the play action. And, and the, the goal of, of doing these kinds of things and faking it to the running game is to get the linebackers to back off. Because, again, they're super, super aggressive. So let's use that to our advantage until we get these linebackers to kind of back off and be like, all right, got to slow down and then start opening up the run game. But if you get them flowing one way while Jimmy Graham's running out the backside and he's just basically flying wide open, even if these are just four or five-yard pickups, we'll just run that all day. 
Something else I'd like to point out, we have not seen Danny Vitale really utilized yet. That is an unscouted look. I wouldn't mind if that gets utilized in this kind of a game, especially with um, a game in which you've got these kind of linebackers, which I don't think are quite on the level of the Bears linebackers. And I, I wouldn't have said that coming into this. I, I wouldn't have said that, and, and one week doesn't make everything. Um, but I, I just I really, really was impressed with what the linebackers did. And sometimes being aggressive works to your advantage. They're going to get there before the Bears linebackers get there, but they're also going to make a lot of bad decisions. And that's how the Falcons ultimately open this up, is just basic play action. The linebackers bit so hard, it just makes a lot more open green grass. The Bears linebackers just basically stayed where they were. They stayed and they waited, and then when they knew definitively what it was, and intelligence is a big part of it, because you got to see it and you got to go to it. As soon as it happened, they were already moving in that direction. So you, you've got three different defenses that I've watched and I haven't really watched the second level too much with the the Packers because I just you know I did a bunch of other stuff but it would be interesting to watch that but with the Bears you have patience but then a lot of speed once once you declare once you show your hand they're going and they had enough speed to be able to be patient and then wait for it to develop and then say okay now go get it that's the kind of defense where if you have a lot of speed at tight end or things like that maybe your guy can't get there right speed on offense could could maybe counter that that bears hesit not even hesitation just patience the vikings defense is intelligent and fast and you can you can kind of mess them up with with counters or play action things where you basically fake one direction go the other direction because they're going to bite so hard and then you had the falcons which was just hesitation it was just i don't know even when when the 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 running back has the ball in his hand already just run as fast as you can to the sideline they're still hesitating what if he cuts back what if he cuts back i gotta be careful dude you're you're the guy you're the only guy that can get out there and secure the edge and you're gonna hesitate it was just a really really pathetic effort and it is nice to be able to kind of assess it because i I didn't know going in what the falcons defensive grades were but i remember watching devondre campbell and he was easy to pick out because it was the guy with the long hair and i just kept seeing this guy with long hair mess up these plays and so finally i was like i gotta see what his grade was he had the second lowest grade on the team so it was kind of nice to be like all right gives you a little confidence in pff you know not like i'm the ultimate arbiter in um football scouting or whatever but just to be able to see it because he he's a guy who had a lot of tackles the stats were in his favor he didn't have a lot of missed tackles he had a lot of big tackles um you would look at it and say how could a guy who had a bunch of tackles be that bad in run defense well that's how because again, as I say with PFF, you can see the the positive, but what about the 15 other plays that you don't see? What about the 15 plays that don't show up on the stat sheet? Or in his case, how about a guy that makes a tackle 15 yards down the field as opposed to making it out the line of scrimmage because he can't get off a block or, or, or get out to the sideline before the, the block gets there? So anyways, as I'm looking at this game, having watched a little bit of the... I, I didn't even really get a chance to watch the Packers offense yet. But yeah, I did. I, that's a lie. I did get to see it. But I didn't do a, a full breakdown or whatever. Anyways, um, it's so depressing to look at this PFF thing where the entire offense is just bad. The highest graded offensive starter is Jimmy Graham on this entire team, and he had an average grade. Adams average, Allison below average, Bakhtiari below average, Taylor below average, Lindsley average, Turner average, Balaga average, Jimmy Graham average, Valdez Scantling average, Rogers below average, and, and um, Jamal Williams average. And if we switch this up, Aaron Jones below average. It's because of the Bears' defense, but man, is that depressing. But anyways, it doesn't matter. So more than likely, what we're going to see here is something to the effect of of a Adams double team, and that can be done in a lot of different ways. But um, my my thought primarily is that they're going to put Trey Waynes on him because he's a less talented corner, and so you put Trey Waynes on him because he's less talented. But then you also double up, um, and then you put Xavier Rhodes, who is your better corner, and you put him on a guy like Marquez Valdez Scantling. Now you've got a double on one guy, you've got a number one on a number two, it creates sort of two mismatches. And I think as far as numbers, the, the Vikings are going to make sure that everything's in place. So it's going to come down to two things. One is winning, right? Marquez is going to have to beat Xavier Rhodes. Geronimo Allison is going to have to be able to beat Jermaine Curse. The offensive line is going to have to be able to beat the defensive line. But it's also going to be about uh, spacing and misdirection. Right, if if we're running play action to draw these linebackers up, and we got Devonte Adams and and you know Scantling, for example, running deep routes, you know Devonte's just running a, a go route, Valdez running a, a deep post or whatever, and then you got Geronimo Allison basically just running a crossing route behind the linebackers, but in in across the face of Curse. The bottom line is Geronimo Allison has to win that. It's you know it's, it's a man beater. Just just go and and beat him across the middle. So and again, it, it, it somebody was asking the question. Um, 
on the Matt LaFleur press conference, somebody asked a question about, you know, you should be able to scheme guys open or whatever. The, the problem with that is there are plays that you can draw up that can win. For example, exactly what I just described is a play in which we should win that. You know, Geronimo Allison should be able to come open across the middle, but it still always comes down to execution. And there's also a, always a counter. You're, you're also always assuming that the defense is going to do something, but if you were to show a defensive coordinator the play you're going to run, it's going to be well defended. So again, you get into this what I call rock, paper, scissors situation where, you, you, you know, you call scissors and they can if they call paper, you're going to obliterate them. Now, it still comes down to execution, but it's so much in your favor that the Vikings basically have to really, really do a fantastic job of compensating and or the offense has to completely blow it. On the flip side, if you call scissors and they call rock, it's not that you can't necessarily beat it, but it's going to take a superhuman effort. That or, again, the Vikings defense to completely botch something. So th- there's always these, these separate dynamics. There's the play calling, but then there's also the execution. And I, I think on offense, from my perspective, it was primarily an execution issue. Some people took issue with the play calling. I'm sure there are situations that could have, would have, should have been different. I, I don't know that level of nuance to know. I mean, you'd have to be in the meeting rooms, and even then it would probably mostly go over my head. Uh, to know conceptually what it is we're trying to do overall as a game plan and how well Matt LaFleur was able to to follow that out. But from what I've been able to see, if you just look at the plays, it's like that, that woulda, shoulda worked, right? I, I go back to the what I had said about the, the Packers' offense versus the Bears' defense in that first video breakdown I did. There were two problems. One is execution. Two is the Bears' defense. We need both of those things corrected, right? This is not the Bears' defense. As much as it is a good defense, it is a beatable defense. And I've already laid out exactly how that works. And again, whenever whenever Matt Ryan had time in the pocket and they were able to get the linebackers to bite, the receivers were winning. I'm, I'm sure it wasn't every time and it wasn't every guy. And if I went back and watched their, their corners, which I'm not going to do because that's unnecessary, I'm willing to bet that there were a lot of victories. And again, Julio was not the primary guy. And, and I feel bad for Julio because... The few times that he's coming open, Matt Ryan just could not throw him a good ball. It was really pathetic. But, I mean, you just you had guys open, and it really is just going to come down to Rodgers needs to be able to get the ball there. And these guys, you know, Devontae's going to have to do a, a, a good job of, of compensating for the fact that he's going to be doubled. He's not always going to be doubled, and when he's not, he's got to take advantage of it. But then these other guys really need to step up. Jimmy Graham, Marquez, Geronimo, um, Trevor Davis, whoever it is that's out there. Maybe Shepard's going to be out there. I have no idea. But... Um, it's about take, taking advantage of opportunities because every team's going to have opportunities, right? I mentioned there were plays where the Falcons had opportunities to convert their downs, terrible throw off the field now. Now you got to punt. In other words, it was the right play call. The defense didn't do a good job of defending it, right? They didn't. It, it was a scissors paper situation. You called the right play, the defensive coordinator called the wrong play. So now it just comes down to execution. Unless of a superhuman effort by the defense, uh, execution is all it's going to take, and, and execution is what failed. So. Really, the, come, as it comes down to winning this game, as I see it, the Packers need to play fast and aggressive up front. Now, that's not going to do anything necessarily for the pass game. And if, and if Kirk Cousins goes completely off and we just can't cover anybody, then we're in trouble. But I don't think that's what's going to happen because I think the pass rush is going to be uh, enough that the, the Vikings are going to focus on running the ball. And if they can't run the ball and they have to focus on throwing it, I think that's going to be problematic because I think the pass rush is going to get there. Now, I don't know. I, I would be even surprised even though this – Vikings offensive line is worse I would be surprised if we get as many pressures because that was just unbelievably superhuman freakish but it's still not ideal with with the revamped defensive front and the inability of this offensive line to to pass block even if they take a step forward which I expect I expect the Packers defensive front to not be quite as effective and I expect the Vikings offensive line to get better but I still don't think that's what they want and and you know so that's essentially it that the defense needs to be good up front the linebackers have to be fast and and decisive, and the offense needs to execute. And I think if we can do those things, we win. Now, I mean, you know, we can go down the line. Well, what happens if the corners are just terrible? And they, Well, then, yeah, then we lose, okay? If the corners are just letting guys come wide open and they can just drop back and, and do a, a three-step drop and launch it 40 yards down the field and you guys are wide open because the safeties are terrible, of course. I'm, I'm talking as generally as I possibly can. We need the defensive front to be as, as dominant as they were against the Bears. That's going to take away most of these run plays, including several outside zone plays that the Falcons couldn't stop. And even if the linebackers can't get there, an aggressive and, and penetrative, if that's a word, enough defensive line is going to blow some of those plays up as well. But then to have the linebackers in to help just to clean up. That's all they got to do is be able to clean up and don't get reached. If we do that, their run game is obliterated. It's done. It's not going anywhere. They'll get a couple, 
um, you know, they're going to win some of these battles, but, but we have to take it away to the point where the same thing we did in week one, take it away and force them to throw the ball. Just say, look, this isn't working and it's not going to work. And I know you're going to run it once in a while and that's cool, but go ahead and throw it. See what happens. At which point you tee off on cousins and they're going to get their chunks. They're going to get some yards. They're going to get some points. But over the course of time, we're relying on them throwing the ball, getting them into third and long situations because they're going to try to run it and not get anywhere. They get into third and long situations. You tee off on the quarterback. And ideally, you know, you, that's when you start looking for sacks. You start looking for picks. You start looking for those kinds of things. You get some momentum going on defense. And again, then it just comes down to the offense needs to execute. I think the opportunities, again, are going to be there. These corners are beatable, the linebackers are trickable, and the safeties are just dominant. But, you know, we're going to be working, I think, shallow field a lot. These quick outs, the crosses across the middle, just just taking advantage of space. And I think the Vikings really left a lot of space on the field for the Falcons, and the Falcons took advantage of that. But, again, they just kept getting in their own way. They marched down the field several times. I would say five, six, maybe seven times they were able to get from one side of the field to the other. But then again, you had a fumble. You had penalties. You had the halftime. You had an interception in the end zone. You had all kinds of craziness. And that's, that, that all goes into the execution portion of this. But, um, yeah, man, we got, uh, we got football tomorrow. And we'll see how it goes. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I necessarily want to make a prediction. Um, prediction just, I don't know. Of course, I'm going to say the Packers are going to win, but it really it just comes down to how are the Packers. I'm, I'm more interested in seeing the development of the Packers, and I, we need to see the defense do the same thing. I, if that was a fluke, we're in trouble. And I'm, I'm convinced we're going to be better than last year. That's not even really a question. It's just a matter of, I mean, if, if they can even come close to replicating what this, this is. A, this, week one was a top five defense, ladies and gentlemen, top five. That was incredible. But of course, you know, nobody really wants to buy it because it's the Packers and it was Mitch Trubisky and even Brett Coleman, who I'm starting to think hates, <laughs> really hates the uh, the Packers. I don't know. I mean, I think he's a Texans fan, but something about it just, he was really mad that the Bears did so poorly. And then he came out and was like talking up the Vikings and stuff. It's like, he, he kind of feel like he's wanting the Packers to lose. I don't know what's going on there. I'd be interested to, to figure that one out. But, uh, you know, he came out with his video talking about how Trubisky was just horrible. And he was. But um, I don't know that he necessarily gave the defense enough credit. A lot of those bad decisions came because there was a collapsing pocket. There was pressure. He was getting hit as he threw. But, uh, again, you know, we need that consistency. And then it, it's really just because as the season progresses, we're going to go in one of, of a couple different ways. The question is, what's going to happen to the defense? What's going to happen to the offense? If the defense can stay the same and the offense can can get better, then the only question is, how much better is the offense going to get? Because if the offense can reach peak potential, that is to say, a team that has a very good offensive line, a great running back, an elite quarterback, and a, a top five wide receiver, which is to say, easily has the potential to be a top five offense. I'm here to tell the rest of the NFL that a team with a top five offense and a top five defense is a favorite to win the Super Bowl. And the Patriots can go eat sand. Yeah, that's right, eat sand. Go ahead and t-shirt that. But that's obviously one slightly unrealistic option. We have to see if this if this offense doesn't progress, I don't know that we get into the playoffs. If the defense regresses, we're in a lot of trouble. So th- this really is just kind of a step to see what progress is being made. And, and the, you know, again, w- wins and losses are unbelievably important, and we need to get this game. But in the long term, I really, you know, j- just putting it out there, if I, if I had to choose between um, the defense stays the same, the offense, however, takes a step, but not a big enough step, and they end up losing to the Vikings. However, the defense stays the same, and they're they're consistent basically throughout the season. And the 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 Packers slowly get better, as to say, that is to say, by about mid season, they're they're actually a really good offense. We're talking top ten offense. But you're going to lose to the Vikings, as opposed to the defense regresses, the Packers offense doesn't look that great, but you sloppily win this game. I don't know. I mean, it, I would never say I want to lose to the Vikings, but I'm just saying that there, there's two dynamics here. There's there's trying to get this team to be an elite team that's actually Super Bowl caliber, and then there's beating the Vikings. I would like both things, but being a team that's, that is a Super Bowl caliber team that is an elite team, I think is more important than this one game. And the only reason I bring that up isn't because, it, you know, I, of course I really, really, really want to beat the Vikings. But the only reason I bring that up is that, that I'm just very, very curious to see, and I'm very, very... 
I, I, I want it so bad. I want this defense to stay dominant. I don't want that to be a one and done. We've seen several times in the past with Dom Capers defenses and things where there would be like the number one run defense in the NFL. And, oh, they're so good. And then it, it, by the time the season's over, it just it doesn't exist. And then the passing defense is no good. And, and, and they're like the, the 21st, 25th, 27th overall defense in the NFL by the time the season's over. And it's just a nightmare. Just, just consistency. And then, of course, health. Um, you know, I haven't really mentioned David Bakhtiari. I think he's going to play, but, um, to say I'm not worried, I mean, that, that is, that's devastating if he's not playing, but I have to assume he is. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're getting him good and rested. And again, it's one of those things where even if it hurts, but you're, you're still kind of able to go, how about we just give it a shot there, big guy. And he was questionable. And I I would say probably like what, like 98% of people that are listed as questionable end up playing. Very rarely is somebody questionable and doesn't play. Doubtful is a different story, but uh, questionable is usually not that big of a deal. So, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I'm um, I'm cautiously optimistic. I mean, the, the one good thing, again, is that I, I didn't see an unbeatable defense. I didn't see a Chicago Bears defense where you're just looking at it going, I don't even know what you do about that. That was just beautifully executed. This is a defense that, that gave the this terrible Falcons offense a billion opportunities. And it really just was a, a case of execution. I think the Falcons had the game won. I mean, if, if you do, if, the the punt block was just essentially they they overloaded one gap. They brought three guys in one gap. You had a guy that were in max protect, and you had a guy that just guessed wrong. Somebody came free, and for some reason he jumps to the right, and the guy comes on his left, and he, he just missed it, and it ends up getting blocked. All right, execution. Vikings get a short field. They they didn't have to do much, and Dalvin Cook again ran through open holes. Um, Kirk Cousins was able to throw two open receivers. One of them was a pretty good pass after Adam Thielen pushed off. That was a touchdown. Congratulations on cheating. Um, but it, it's still going to be a tough game because, again, this is a talented defense and a very capable offense, and it really is just going to come down to sound fundamental football. If the Packers can do that, they win. And I'm going to stop talking in circles now and let you go. So, anyways, have yourselves a fantastic Saturday. Um, I will talk to you tomorrow. We're going to do a little bit more generalized NFL-type stuff. But you folks have yourselves a fantastic day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.